Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Lara, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about snakes in Florida. And what we're going to talk about today are um, quite a few snake species in Florida. We're gonna talk a little bit about identification, um, especially around the species that I get the most questions about. We're going to talk some about snake behavior, why snakes might be in a certain area compared to other areas. And then we're gonna use that information to promote coexisting with snakes in our environment. So how many native snake species are found in Florida? This is also a good time for me to warn you that if you are afraid of snakes, there are a lot of snake pictures in this presentation. So um, just, just wanted to let you all know. The answer is 44 snake species in the state of Florida. And we are looking at one of them right here on this log. This is a Florida banded water snake. Uh, he's a good guy. So let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so we're gonna be talking predominantly about snake species that are found in the majority of the state today. And we have six species that are venomous. Now the six species are included in that 46 species. So it is not, or 44 species. So it is not an additional six species, but six of them are venomous. Now the difference between venomous and poisonous is poisonous, you need to eat something for it to harm you. And venomous, the venom needs to be injected into your skin. So that is the difference between a venomous snake and say a poisonous berry. The four, only four of our venomous snakes are found statewide. So two of them are only found in small areas and we'll talk about them in just a moment. But the four venomous snakes that you can find all over the state of Florida are the pygmy rattlesnake, the diamondback rattlesnake, the water moccasin, which is also known as the cottonmouth, and the coral snake. If you have the snakes in Florida flip book put out by the University of Florida, the map on the left shows where we identify northern Florida, central Florida, and south Florida for purposes of what snakes are present in what areas. So these are the two snake, venomous snake species that are only found in a small portion of the state. If you are in the Panhandle or if you're in Northeast Florida, these are two that you might wanna keep an eye on. Um, we are not going to be talking much more about them today though. So I get a lot of questions about snakes that people think are copperheads and being down in Polk County, which is down here as a reminder, we are not thought to have copperheads down here by any native range. Now, people have all sorts of reptiles as pets, and so I like to say that you can't rule anything out 100%, but they are not naturally found in this part of the state. So unless you are in those areas or in the very adjacent areas to those green splotches, um, these are not snakes that you need to be very concerned about. So you have IFAS Extension and our Dep Department of Wildlife Ecology organizes snake identification by its most obvious marking. Now you might have a snake that is both blotched and have stripes. It is the most obvious marking and that's where it's going to be in our identification guide. We only have one with a diamond marking though. So if you see diamonds on the back of a snake, it is very important that you back up slowly and let that snake get away on its own. Because that diamondback snake is of course our Eastern diamondback rattlesnake. It is venomous and it is again, the only native species with a distinct diamond pattern on the back of its body. Here you can sort of make out the spade shaped head of the rattlesnake. All of our pit viper species have this heart shaped or spade shaped head. Um, but this right here, that is that diamond pattern. So it is often outlined in a lighter color, but as um, we will talk about for several other species, snake coloration can vary both on geographic location and time of the year. If the snake is about to shed its skin, its color will be much more dull. And if it has just shed, it will be much more vibrant. Um, not all rattlesnakes make a loud noise. They might have a rattle, they can choose whether or not to use it. So you can't rely just on the rattle to identify a diamondback rattlesnake. 
So moving on, we have another poll question. So you, the majority of you guessed A, and that is correct. A is the venomous snake of these three. Now, all three of these are native species, and we're going to talk about them in a bit. Um, but this, the snake that is under the A depiction, that is our pygmy rattlesnake. You see the oak leaves and the little um, chunks of grass here. He's a little guy. He um, tends to be less than two and a half feet long, but he is a sassy little snake. So we are now going to move into the blotched snakes, which all three of the ones that we just looked at were blotched in pattern. It is the predominant pattern that they have. And these um, bulleted snake names on the right hand side of your screen, this is just a um, just a short list of some of our blotched snakes. Um, and then some of them you might not think of as a blotched snake, like the black racer. So that picture of the guy on the far right, that was actually a juvenile black racer. As you can see here, he has all sorts of patterns and blotches all down the length of his back. And when he becomes an adult, he will have this nice, beautiful, glossy black um, coat there. And I do apologize, it looks like my pictures are, are blocked over there. So we're gonna move on to the striped snakes. Um, so the predominant thing here is going to be a stripe that goes from nose to tail. This is different from the band snakes, banded snakes, that we'll talk about in a moment where the bands go across their body, more like a belt. So striped snakes, you're looking for a pattern that goes from nose to tail. Banded snakes, the pattern goes across their body from side to side. Um, Everglades rat snake is a striped snake when it is an adult, but it is another one that is kind of blotchy when it is a juvenile. And that snake in the top picture, that yellow one, that is your Everglades rat snake or your yellow rat snake. As I mentioned, when he's a juvenile, he'll have more of a splotchy, blotchy appearance. And then the bottom snake here, this is your common garter snake. So as you'll see, he has other patterns on him, almost a checkerboard. This um, can be more dull in color and harder to see, but predominantly it will have this long yellow stripe along its body as well. So now we're on to our banded water snakes. As I said, this is a pattern that goes across the body instead of nose to tail. And this is a category that I would like you to learn well if you get the chance. And the reason for that is we have two venomous snakes in the banded snake category. We have the coral snake, which is a small snake. You might know a rhyme about it. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then we also have the water moccasin, which is also known as the cottonmouth. So cottonmouth or water moccasin is the snake that I get the most questions about by far. Um, I would say at least two thirds of the snake pictures that people email me they want to know if it's a cottonmouth. Is this a water moccasin? Is it going to attack my dog? Is it going to hurt my child? Um, all of the pictures on your screen at the moment are all of the cottonmouth. And it's important to note that they can change color throughout their life. So on the far left over here, this is a very young cottonmouth. He is very, very little. This is just a little um, fish net that someone is holding him up safely, I hope. Um, but if you notice, he has a very light color, almost mustard-like, mustardy brown color. And he has those very distinct bands across his body. This stripe across his eye is also a fairly good indicator that you are looking at a cottonmouth. Now, as the cottonmouth ages and grows up, when he gets to be, oh, about a foot and a half, maybe two feet, he'll be much, much darker in color. So this is your typical adult cottonmouth. It's a much more tawny, tan brown color. Still has very distinct banding. Um, this is also depicting their strike position, which is how they get the name cottonmouth. So when they open their mouth and try to scare you, um, they usually do a good job. They'll have a bright white mouth um, or it'll be light pinkish blush color. But even from this picture where he's all in the, the mud with the detritus and bark, you can still see that stripe across his eye up here. Now, as they mature and become wise old snakes, um, their coloration will become more solid. So if this snake 
were up close and you were far closer than I recommend you get, you might see the banding. You can see a hint of it on the um, closer to the belly side of this cotton mouth, but you can really get a sense for how wide bodied and um, muscular these snakes are. His head is right here in the middle, in case you haven't found it yet. And he still has that very distinct dark eye band. And you can sort of make the outline of that spade shaped head in this picture. Now these two pictures down here are to give you a better idea of his, um, of his head shape and his eye. Again, you can see that dark band across his eye and he has that flat spade shaped head. In this picture, you can also see this is sort of in between these two pictures as far as how um, vibrant those bands are. Now, if you look at all of these pictures, something you'll notice is this is a very heavy bodied snake. They are rather wide for how long they are. And that's because they are very good predators. So um, some of the lookalikes are banded water snakes. Even if they have a similar pattern, they will not be quite as muscular or thick bodied. And we'll get a picture of those now. So on the left, you have more pictures of the cotton mouth. Again, that dark eye band, that flat head that is a spade shape if you look at it from the top or from behind. Um, and then on the right, we have two of our banded water snakes. So these are also native and they are wonderful in our ecosystem, but these are non-venomous. Unfortunately, they are quite often killed because people think they're cotton mouths. We're going to get to whether or not you should try and harm, harass, or kill a snake later. Um, short answer is no. But these water snakes are wonderful for our ecosystem. They are completely harmless as far as um, a venom incident might be concerned. But as you can see, it's, it would be easy if you were not familiar with these two snakes to mix them up. So I'm going to give you a couple hints so you can tell them apart from a safe distance. If you look at the face of the cottonmouth, I like to say he has kind of an angry demeanor. I don't want to say that they're all mean, but he does kind of look mean if you look at him. Compared to our banded water snakes over here, they're much friendlier looking. So our venomous snakes have a cat eye or a slit pupil. Um, and everyone tells me, oh, but I'm not going to get close enough to see that. That's a good point. I don't want you to get super close, but even from a good distance, if you look at this picture at the top where they're on the tree branch, you can see that this is a very bright, round pupiled eye. They also tend to have this coloration on their bottom jaw that looks a lot like fangs from a distance. So they're trying their hardest to look scary. Um, but don't, don't mind them. They're, they're harmless. They're great for our ecosystem. And in general, trying to kill a snake is a dangerous endeavor for people. So again, look for the shape of the body. The real heavy bodied snake is the cotton mouth. And then take a look at its head shape and its eye. If it doesn't have that dark eye band, if it does have the fang-like scale pattern and a round pupil, it is a banded water snake and not a cotton mouth. So we have another poll question. Again, take a look at these pictures before we bring the poll question up. This is one that a lot of our youth learn about in school, and this is the venomous coral snake. So take a moment and look at these pictures. Your options are the two pictures on the left are A, and the two pictures on the right are B. The majority of you are correct. So the venomous coral snake is the one on the right hand side of the screen. And we're going to look at what he looks like. So the easiest, I'm going to go back real quick. So you might have heard some rhymes at school. Um, red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, kill a fellow. Um, to be quite honest, if you're not really familiar with that rhyme and you are presented with a situation in which you have one of these snakes in front of you, you might not remember which way that rhyme goes. You can really make it work any way you try to. So I do not recommend using rhymes to tell these snakes apart. The coral snake is actually pretty easy to identify, especially once you consider there are only a handful of species that have this red, black, and yellow pattern. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the coral snake. So the first thing that you should notice about this snake is 
the bright colors, the red, yellow, and black. But the tell it apart from your car scarlet snake and king snake, the things you'll want to look for are the black snout and the dull red color. Now this can change over time, like I mentioned, um, but it doesn't matter if it is red, black, and yellow in the state of Florida, and it has a black snout, it is the coral snake and not one of its lookalikes. The red band on the coral snake will also have a dark spattering pattern on it. At times it can be quite dark, like the image on the left, where you almost can't even tell that that is red. But it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a spray paint effect on there. Other times it'll be bright, bright red. Um, but the easiest way to tell is look for that black snout. He also does not have a very distinctive head shape. If you look at it, it almost looks like he doesn't have a head. And he's got this itty bitty eye right here. Um, coral snakes are quite secretive and they're quite small. If you notice the pine needles on the left hand side of the screen, um, they're, they're generally pretty small, less than two and a half feet. They like um, wet, wetter environments, but they can be found in any habitat in Florida. Um, but they're very secretive and they, they don't love being around people. The other good thing about the coral snake is while they are quite dangerous and they've got a, a really intense venom, um, they don't have the fangs that most people associate with pit vipers um, because the coral snake is not in the pit viper family. So if you wear protective equipment, and what I mean by that is wear socks, wear hiking boots, good pants if you're out hiking in an area that might have coral snakes, it's going to be very challenging for that snake to bite you. Um, if you step on it and you're wearing flip-flops or your feet are exposed, it's much more likely that they'll be able to get a good grip on you. Um, it's thought that up to 50% of coral snake bites are actually dry bites, in which case they don't inject the venom. So this is a snake that we need to be aware of. We need to teach kids what to look out for. But the main thing you should do here is back away slowly and let this snake do its own thing. It's a very beautiful snake as long as we are able to respect how dangerous it can be. So we're gonna move on to solid color snakes. These are also, this is a really, really big um, group of snakes also. Um, but you'll notice here we put the cotton mouth or the water moccasin in with the solid color snakes because they can look very dark um, as they age. We've got the black racer in this group also. If you remember, they are blotched as a juvenile, but they are a solid black color as an adult. You'll also see that we have the eastern indigo snake highlighted in purple here. This is a species that is protected in the state of Florida. They are very rare and very large. So this snake can get up to and exceed five and a half to six feet. It's a dark black color, very similar to what's going on behind me. And it has an iridescence to it. So it's got that purple blue reflectiveness in the sun. These are beautiful snakes that I hope one day to see in person in the wild, but their habitat is dwindling. And so they are a protected rare species in the state of Florida. So these are some of our solid color snakes, just to see, show you how diverse they can be. That upper left-hand picture, this one right here, this is your red belly mud snake. So again, remember, our snakes can have different patterns to them, but we're looking for the most obvious pattern. And in this case, it's the dark glossy black of um, the red belly mud snake, which as his name implies, he likes wetland type areas. This is your rough green snake. They're very charismatic, bright green, very little. This is mulch. Um, down here, you've got your black racer, which people routinely report seeing hanging out on top of their shrubbery or out on their sidewalks near their home. Black racers are very common in residential areas, um, and they're a great snake to have around. They eat all sorts of things that we think of as pests, um, like large bugs and small rodents and things like that. How many people consider themselves um, happy about snakes? If you like snakes, go ahead and raise your hand. Because most people tune into these webinars and meetings because they do not like snakes. Excellent, so we had quite a few on this call, but the vast majority I would say still not a fan of snakes and that's okay. You don't have to like every critter that we have on this planet, but the point of this slide is to let you know that there is very little reason to actually fear them. 
So when we are talking about snake bites and fatalities, I don't know that most people who are afraid of a snake biting them or afraid of a snake actually fear death. Um, but if you do, I'm not sure it's great news, but you are way more likely to die from other things. So you're actually nine times more likely to die from lightning and living in Florida, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big number. Um, but in general, the Center for Disease Control reports seven to 8,000 snake bites that make it to an emergency room every year. But of those seven or 8,000, only five or six people actually die. Um, that is not to say it's not extremely painful. Um, especially if you're in the Western US, there are a lot more venomous snakes in our desert communities and in the Western United States than there are in Florida. So it is more likely to have a venomous snake bite out West. Um, it is also most likely to happen in the spring or summer. Snakes are reptiles, so they are more active when it is warm out. But if you look at this chart on the right, which can be found on um, the Johnson Labs wildlife page, you see snake bites at six or five or six per year. And then you have spider bites, dog attacks, and then lightning strikes is all the way up there at 54 per year, which is a bit staggering to me, still seems high. So it's not to say that you shouldn't fear snakes. I understand a lot of people do, but if we can calm our fear down a little bit and control our behavior, we can do a lot to protect ourselves from snakes and protect snakes from us. So snakes ultimately have two defenses, unless you're this super cool hognose snake. So snakes can flee or they can bite you. Um, that's really all they have going for them. Now the hognose, I'd like you to know that the snake in this picture is 100% alive. He is only playing dead like a possum. So if you see a dead snake, it is very important that you do not try to pick it up. Just because it appears dead does not mean it is dead. So think about if you had a squirrel in your yard. If you grabbed that squirrel, what would it do? It would probably bite you, scratch you, make a whole bunch of noise, and try to escape. If you were to do the same thing to a snake, it can't really make noise. It doesn't have claws to claw at you. Its only defense is to bite you. It doesn't always mean that it's going to inject venom if it's a venomous snake, but biting you is one of the only ways that they can really let you know that they are not happy. So the other things they'll do are get in that strike position. They'll try to show you that they are not happy about the situation. Um, and to be quite honest, you're probably not happy about it either. So what should we do? If you find yourself in a position where you have intentionally or unintentionally cornered a snake, you wanna back away from it slowly, give it an exit route, and try your hardest to remain calm. I know that sounds a bit intense if you're one of the people on our webinar who intensely dislikes snakes, but if you remain calm, it is more likely that your scenario is gonna work out for the best. If you're going to be hiking or camping or working in an area where you know there are a lot of snakes, I do recommend that you wear protective equipment like shoes, socks, long pants, etc. And then think about areas around your home where you might accidentally corner a snake. They do often like to be under things and behind things. So be cautious when you pull your garbage can out to put it on the curb. Be careful if you're moving a pile of firewood to a different section of your yard. Wear leather gloves if you are uh, clearing out the vegetation for an area. So now that you can name some of the snakes and I've told you, you don't have to be afraid of them. You probably still don't want them all over your house. Um, and that's okay, we understand that. But they are important parts of our ecosystem. So if we can minimize the amount of interaction that people have with snakes around their home, it's more likely that people will care for them and avoid harming them. So in order to prevent some encounters, you wanna think like a snake. Look for food. What do snakes eat? Well, they predominantly this is based on the size of the snake and the habitat it's in. Your cottonmouths, your water snakes, all of our aquatic species, they like to eat things in the water. So they will actually hunt for fish in shallow water. Um, same thing with um, 
other things that live near water like amphibians and frogs, um, snakes that might be in your yard like a black racer. They're going to be going after lizards, small frogs, large insects, anything they can get um, their mouth on. And so you need to think about where that food might live. You also need to think about shelter and cover. So they want to hide from things that might eat them like large birds. Um, great blue herons love to eat snakes. So if you look for those things, you can start to imagine where a snake might be found in your yard. And you can try to keep those areas away from your doors and your garage. So you can really, if you want to, you can remove all the habitat that snakes or their prey might like, but you're also going to be removing all the habitat that the wildlife in your area use as well. So you can also consider providing habitat in a far corner of your yard that's away from your home if you have a property large enough for that. So these are just some ways that you can prevent encounters. In general, it, it really boils down to being a good neighbor. So keep your debris piles neat and away from the home. Um, try to remove prey habitat. If you have an orange tree or a vegetable garden, make sure that you're removing those fruits and vegetables after they have ripened so that they do not have an opportunity to rot on the vine or near the tree. Um, anything that attracts rodents and other insects is attracting prey for the snakes. So you want to remove those. If you live in a more rural area and you have undeveloped land on one side of your property or more, um, there is a last resort and that would be erecting or installing fencing to keep the snake out. And that's what I'm showing here in the bottom right hand corner. Now this fencing would need to be dug down into the ground to prevent it from slithering under it. Um, it's hard to maintain. It's not exactly the most beautiful fencing you've ever seen in your life and it can be quite expensive. So this is a last resort. In general, if you keep your grass mowed, your vegetation well-maintained, um, and keep firewood piles away from the home, you have much less chance of having a snake come in your door or your backyard. Keep all food tightly closed. All of the bullet points at the bottom, so around here, these really revolve around rodent control. If you can control the prey source, you can reduce the amount of snakes that might be attracted to your area. And then because we are natural resources agents, Lara and I do recommend that you avoid using rodent poison